we're at. We got a we're a little deeper into the AC system here than we did last time we talked in here. And um, uh, one of the things you need to know is uh, R134 ball is at 15 below zero, and R1234 ball is at 22 below zero. That's fair enough. Numbers. Don't bend refrigerant to the air. Always wear safety glasses. And you want to look right here. The refrigerant that's in the, in the 1234 container is this color, and the 134 is like that. When the liquid boils, it absorbs heat. When the refrigerant boils at 0, it causes it to get very cold. We'll make advantage of that. What happens when you put alcohol on your hand? It gets cold, right? Yeah. What happens when you put antifreeze or brake fluid on your hand to get warm? Why? What's the difference? They're both of them are liquid. It's got to do with the boiling point. The boiling point of antifreeze and brake fluid is really high, but the boiling point of alcohol is low. Got it? So as it evaporates, it takes heat away. It actually carries heat. Um, all right, got that written down. Fixed orifice system. Talked a little bit about this before. We're going to go a little bit more into it. Uh, you'll uh, accumulator. If you got an accumulator, you'll have a fixed orifice tube typically. Unless, you know, the, I'll talk a little bit more about the vans have got, like your vehicle, got an expansion valve in the back. You know? But that's what that accumulator looks like. See? And typically the charge port will be on the accumulator. That's what the orifice tube looks like right there. Some of y'all have already seen that, but we've got a worksheet on that. <coughs> and there's your evaporator where it changes for states from a liquid to a gas and absorbs the heat. It changes from a gas back to a liquid in here and gives up heat. Okay, and there's your THP system, thermal expansion valve. Uh, a lot of the time you'll have a little bulb here that's actually sensing the temperature of that tube, and that's what causes the orifice to change shape. Now most of the ones you see nowadays is a little expansion <laughs> block uh, that actually has both of these tubes going through the same little block. The old family <coughs> expansion valve, then the one on yours, will be one that's kind of like this right here. Let's say you can have one like that. See how that's got that same little tube right here? Uh, but it's measuring right here. And the refrigerant is going one way through in the big hose and the other way through the orifice. It actually goes in two opposite directions through that thing. Thermal expansion valve system will have a refrigerant super dryer. If it's got a receiver dryer, it's going to be on the high side and it'll be smaller. Um, why would they make this so much bigger than that? Well, you got more pressure, you need less square inches, right? You got more pressure, less square inches. You know, break, you know that on a brake line, you got like 2,000 pounds of pressure when you're handling applying the brakes. Why do my brake lines are so tiny? If you got a big line, you'd have to have some seriously strong because of the square inches you got. All right, thermal expansion valve is a variable orifice system. The orifice is in place where high pressure liquid becomes low pressure liquid. And then it evaporates in there. The sensing tube reacts to the suction line temperature and changes the size of the liquid orifice to prevent evaporator freezing. And the receiver dryer contains desiccant, removes little amounts of moisture from the refrigerant, and it's made a particular way. Now, the fixed orifice system is, uh, doesn't have an expansion valve, it's just got this orifice that never changes. Now, they do have. I had not seen those, these on any vehicles I've worked on, but I heard about them at the MAX convention. They've got a little orifice uh, that looks like a fixed orifice, but it can actually change. You know, but uh, that's not even anything I'm going to worry with right now. The accumulator, that's this thing right here. You might notice how it was drawn, and you can see the, the filter down there around the hole. You know, It gets a little bit of oil here, and it grabs refrigerant out of here and pulls it in there. They got this pulling vapor, see, because it's about half full of oil and liquid. And that oil has got refrigerant trapped in it, but that oil is getting pulled in here so it can oil the compressor about like a chainsaw. That's how that's going through here. Uh, and of course, that's a little receiver dryer thing, you know, a little bitty thing. Um, but anyway, uh, the oil and refrigerant uh, has got to be pulled in a little bit, pulled through that hole. So, and the refrigerant oil has got to be a kind of oil that mixes to the refrigerant. You put the wrong kind in there and burn it up. And that's a little better picture of that, you know, uh, low side. And so basically, you're, you might notice it's grabbing the vapor out of here. You see how it's partially full of liquid? You have desiccant bags in there. That's what that bag here is. And then on your uh, TXV side, it's on the high side. You got a little filter here and a pickup tube down there so that uh, the refrigerant's got to pass through there in order to you know, go out there. Desiccant actually is usually a little things in a pill bottle that do not eat. That's desiccant it keeps it dry. That's what it does. Uh, rear air on vans will have a separate evaporator. Heater core will usually be outfitted with a TXV even if the front air has a fixed orifice. Because uh, we've had to change TXVs on the rear ones sometimes. If you have too much oil in the system, it won't cool right because it will coat everything with oil. You've got to flush it out. Uh, refrigerant flows through these. Condenser, suction line, 
evaporator, expansion valve, and then there's your discharge line. The discharge line is the one between the compressor and the condenser. The suction line is actually on this side, usually goes through the, uh, uh, you know, goes through the evaporator there. And so basically, in other words, excuse me, this actually goes to the compressor. This is not really a drawing wheel. Uh, but anyway, the suction line basically leaves the evaporator and goes to the compressor, uh, you know, through here. And then the, the discharge line. On this, is what I see missing off of here is a liquid line. A liquid line is typically, you know, this goes to the condenser, but from here to the evaporator is a liquid line that's not pictured here. Uh, now the subcooler is a peculiar thing. I drew this myself using Microsoft Paint. Uh, sometimes it's on the condenser and basically what you'll have to do is screw some little plug out and a little sock that goes up in there. And, uh, and so what you're doing on these subcoolers, and a lot of vehicles have got these now, on the subcooler you're basically not only condensing the refrigerant back into a liquid, you're also cooling it. So that not only is it liquid, but it's cool liquid when it goes back into the evaporator. It makes it a lot better. And you might see the, the little, uh, this thing right here is over here. And see you got a little bit of a, this, this condenser is the upper part of this, the subcooler will be the bottom part. So you got cool liquid refrigerant coming out of it. Um, all right, you got electrical stuff, fans, clutches, switches, that kind of stuff. Now all of this stuff is part of the system. Um, they actually have a thing called an AC amplifier on some vehicles that is a little computer that's totally dedicated to nothing but air conditioning. And they may interface with the engine controller and stuff. I got an interesting story to tell you on a later date about one that uh, smacked us around as a Buick. But anyway, we'll go into that later. But you got your control head, you know, it's a little amplifier on that. Here's a simple schematic. You've got an on switch, you got a high pressure switch, you got a low pressure switch, and I'm sending a wire in series so that if either one of them opens up, it's going to drop. Uh, and you got your AC clutch down there, and it basically goes right through that trim. All right? Now, usually on today's vehicle, the pressure switches are sending a signal to a controller. That red Jeep you're working on out there has got two switches on it, and they're both basically going to the controller feeding voltage to it. And so it's looking for voltage on those inputs so that it'll know what to do, uh, whether to operate the clutch or not, or, so, or turn on the fan, and that kind of thing. So you got a high pressure switch and you got a low pressure switch, and both of them are basically going to be talking to different pins on the engine controller or the same one, depending on how they're wired. Uh, and you got your AC clutch. You notice how the relay is driven by the clutch, I mean by the PCM, and the PCM totally decides whether or not to open and close the uh, relay and drive the clutch. All right. Now that PCM AC input, that's a 2000 F-150. Uh, and it's a old powertrain control module that's watching that one. It controls the relay too. But you notice how these switches are in, or in, in stacked in series. See? Both of them have to be closed in order for that thing to operate the clutch. Uh, 1041 on the PCM. And, uh, that actually, interestingly enough, that those older schematics tell you what the pressures are. See, it's open at or above 445 PSI, closed at below 260. And this one here is normally open uh, at below 24.5 PSI and closed at 43.5. See, because of the differential between when they open and when they close. All right. Now, pay attention to this diode because it's important. If that diode, for some strange reason, turns into a shorted like a piece of wire or something, Every time this AC compressor clutch de-energizes, it'll send a voltage, a high voltage spike back in there, and it'll you know damage something because you don't want a big spikes on that line. Uh, but anyway, that's what that diode and, just, and all these AC clutch compressor in that circuit, there's a diode in there somewhere. GM used to just put a diode right there where it plugged into the compressor. You got to put it in there the right way. If you put it in the wrong way, you create a dead short. That's what the diodes, one way valve for electricity, right? All right, and so whenever you de-energize de that compressor clutch, it causes that 400 volt spike that would ordinarily go screaming back up here to chase its tail and go away. Um, and so basically it, it neutralizes that. Relays have got a little a clamping resistor in them, uh, wired parallel with the coil for that same reason. This is a wide open throttle relay. That one was a normally closed thing, typically, almost your earlier Fords. And whenever you give it the gas, it would energize the relay, and then that would drop the compressor out because of how, they think, how these things wear it up. But, uh, anyway, fan control is really important. you got a step resistor there. Uh, whenever this thing is running through all of the resistors, you're on low. When it's running through two of them, you're on you know, slightly higher speed. When you totally go around the resistor, sometimes you'll energize a relay. You know, it does that. So your blower relay, you notice this? 
Look at that. Your blower relay is going to be feeding power all the time to that. But the ground is delivered through the resistor. And the resistor will typically have a thermal fuse in it, you know, so they could, and say something happens and that blower and motor is not moving air, you don't want this getting hot and set the vehicle on fire. One time I was driving along and there was this uh, uh, woman out there and she had this uh, vehicle of an explorer or something sitting around with a hood up and it was, you know, about 618 guys standing around trying to figure out why her air conditioner blew smoke out the register and uh, they were under the hood and all that kind of stuff. And I, I'd open the door and I could smell the burning leaves. And I said, you had your fan on load, didn't you? She goes, yeah. I said, you got leaves in there laying on that uh, resistor. And, uh, you know, turn off your fan and drive it over and have somebody at your local shop pull up that uh, blower resistor out of there get the leaves out of the evaporator case and that smoke will go away. <laughs> but when you smell burning leaves, you know, you have that issue with that. But it's going to get hot. If you got fan vibrations, check for crud in the fan. You know, if it's shaking, you ever you just shake the whole dash sometimes? Well, this fan right here needs to be perfectly balanced so it'll run smooth. And uh, let's see, who's involved with putting that uh, fan on that uh, Ford truck? Did you do that? That was a bear, wasn't it? Wasn't too bad. Of course, when I went back and put it in there, it took me about eight minutes to change it. Okay. I don't know what Charles' problem was. All right. Now, right, when you turn on the AC and select where you want the air to go, these doors make it happen. The blend door, that's heater core, got hot water in there. Well, that blend door, when that's closed up, all the air that's coming in there is going to go through this and come straight out, you know, either to the floor or the register or wherever you've got this, this mode door changes where the air goes. The blend door changes whether it's cold or warm. And even if everything's working right, right here, the blend door can actually make it blow hot air whenever there's nothing else wrong with it. And of course, you know, you got outside air or inside air. Uh, will you get better gas mileage running your AC on max or norm? Oh. Huh? You got those two choices, max or norm. Like you're driving to Atlanta and it's 100 yeah. degrees. Max. Why? Because you're recirculating the air. You're the air and the compressor's not running as much. Right? But if you're in norm coming in, you're having to, you know, do a lot more work. Uh, you'd think max would blow more gas, wouldn't you? I mean, if you, think, if you just think about it. In order to control the blend door more precisely, there's a blend door actuator that can stop anywhere in its travel. Even if they don't have any other electronics on the vehicle at all, a lot of times they'll have an electronic blend door actuator, and the little uh, blend door, you know, function is electric switch will be a potentiometer, and it'll drive it through some electronics and all that. Very few, you still, very few vehicles most use vacuum anymore, and that's just what I showed you there. That's a, that's a vacuum door actuator. I hated those things. Uh, all right, what do we need to know? Uh, this is the one. You remember I told you the other day, and I didn't know how to turn the AC on when we got in that Buick. This is what that panel looks like on that Buick. You know, it's basically a little CRT thing, like a back in the uh, early James Bond days. You know. Uh, now we need to know how to operate the air conditioner on vehicle working on. All right, the next thing, when we're looking on the AC, working on the AC because it doesn't cool well or doesn't cool at all, we turn on the AC and see if the compressor is cool. It may take a few seconds for it to turn it on, so be patient. If it doesn't run, what do we do next? Find the fittings. I love the manufacturer to put both ports in a place where they're easy to find. You know, some of them are just right there. Some of them, there was a Jaguar we worked on, and the low side fitting was underneath the car behind the tire on the passenger's driver's side. How are you able to find that? I mean, you look all over the car looking for that. You know, better find you some shop manual to make sure to tell you. Low side port is usually on the suction line or on the accumulator, and the high side port tends to be on the discharge line between the compressor and the condenser. Now, the one that was confusing about hers, the one that she's working on that uh, uh, Jeep, is uh, it looks like the low side's on the liquid line, but the orifice is between the condenser and the charge port. If you notice on the GMCs and the Chevrolets, the two, it looks like the high and the low side charge ports are on the same line. The orifice is between those. You got it? All right. Connect the identifier so you'll know what's in the system before you do anything else. If it's contaminated, like this one right here was, see 76% R12 and 23% or that's the actual one we checked in here. Now remove the trash gas, put it in a gray bottle with a yellow top. There's a gray bottle with a yellow top. Got this machine that we use just for that, it's a dedicated machine. Connect the identifier and know what's in the system. And it shows the gas is pure and what kind of system it is. Find out what a static pressure is. Static pressure is what you see when you hook the gauges up before you do anything else. I hook the machine up. Look where they go. There's yeah, not any good numbers for static pressure, but this looks pretty good. Say 100 pounds, 100 pounds. This is a different gauge range than that. Than that one there. All right. Uh, so you, that's why the needles are in different places. See, this one goes to 500, that goes to 350. Although the last part of it is a real low resolution. 
Uh, if the pressure is really good, it's pretty good about the system low on juice, you know. Yeah, in other words, uh, most systems the compressor won't even engage at the low pressure, you know. Uh, you don't, you can't look at this pressure and tell anything other than the compressor ought to be running based on, you know, the pressure because of the switches, you know. A full vacuum is 30 inches on the gauge right there if you're, when you're vacuuming it out. If there is pressure, use it to recover the gas, you know, as long as you've got the right stuff in there. Uh, on cold days, you might have to run the engine long enough to get the engine part good or not. If it's 50 degrees out there, you're not going to get all the juice out of it unless you run it really, get it really good and hot under there. You know, some of the newer machines, they claim they'll get it all out. Uh, you know, uh, but with the new uh, J, you know, standard. Uh, how much? Note how much came out and compare that to the spec. Watch what it pulled out of there. The machine will tell you what it pulled out because it's weighed it on a scale back there. Pay attention to how much oil was extracted and recharged with the same amount of oil. Important too. Still won't run with a full charge. We're going to find and remove the AC relay uh, terminal feed. Find the relay terminal feed in the A to C clutch. Now, don't just go in there and indiscriminately start jumping stuff because if the PCM has got a ground coming to that relay and you jump power into a wire the PCM got grounded, you destroy the driver in the PCM. Now, you better make sure you know which terminal is which, right? You remember how we, yeah? Uh, wouldn't it be easier to check the relay first before starting to do everything else? Well, you can. I mean, that's uh, not a bad idea, but what we're wanting to do is check the circuits. Right now, we're checking the circuits. Uh, a lot of times, too, if you can actually feel the relay and see if it clicks, too, that's not going to tell you the relay is bad or good. It just tells you it's getting a signal. Uh, all right, so if we pull the relay out and we get our test line, we got to find the one. we got to make sure we know which one's going out of the compressor. Hook up to the positive side of the battery, hook a test light, and that light lights up. You remember how we did the pump the other day? Same principle of last. If this thing is, if there's a ground coming through the load, then you ought to read that ground right there with that test light if you've got the relay removed. But if you don't read a ground, if you don't read a ground, then this is probably a wide open. Of course, you can have another problem uh, there, but I'll, I'll show you one about that too. All right. Now, you can also check the AC clutch relay output with a test light if you know how. Now, actually, we're going underneath that relay and touching that little terminal and watching it click that, turn that light off and on. If I see that light turn on, but the compressor clutch hasn't pulled in, See, if the air gap gets a little too wide on it and it starts to get hot, I mean, in other words, if it gets warmed up, if it's been running for a while and that compressor won't pull in and you've got too much air gap, you need to reset, re adjust your air gap on your compressor. All right, so if that's like say it's dark, you know, the compressor clutch is most likely burned out, don't forget to check the wire and the ground connection. Because if the wire is broke, you'll have the same problem. If it's grounded, it's disconnected, you'll have the same problem. It usually will be that. Terminals right here, if somebody has been taking a little sharp test line and they've crammed them into terminals and spread them out, you have a problem too. You got it? I have it too. Don't, don't cram the terminal in there. You know, I mean, don't, don't shove it in there and spread the terminal out. That's the aggravating thing in the world. Some of these, some of these if you're buying a pigtail, sometimes you'll pay a lot of money for it. All right, with the relay removed, the AC on, you should have two powers and two grounds. Got me? With the AC on and the relay removed, you ought to be able to check those terminals. You ought to find two powers and two grounds. You want to remember that? Two powers, two grounds. Two powers, two grounds. You got it? All right. Cool's fine. Then stop after driving a while. Bump the clutch. In other words, if it's everything is like it ought to be and the clutch didn't pull in because it's got, you know, you need to take some shims out or use your GM special tool to push it in a little farther, I'm going to take a screwdriver handle and bump that clutch. And if I bump the clutch, it goes click and it kicks in and starts cooling. <laughs> And then it drops out and won't pull back in again. I know that I need to do an air gap setting on that. Uh, Chevy sometimes need a special puller to set the gap and move the hub. You can also use the data stream to look for HVAC inputs and outputs. This one right here was one that we had. It was cooling. It was pulling all the way down to 20 degrees, but the evaporator temperature says it was reading 48 degrees. Now, what's the problem with that? It should be turning off the compressor, but it wasn't. What happens if it goes to 20 degrees? All that water that's sweating under the evaporator turns into ice, doesn't it? Clogs the evaporator. You lose your airflow. Bad scene, right? Uh, we had seen a Dodge truck one time that was doing that, and this old uh, cycling switch was staying stuck shut all the time. So we put a cycling switch on that one. There's a bunch of different things you need to do to check that. Some of them have got it, the evaporator temperature sensor only four fusions is down in the, you know, case where you pull a dash back out of the way to get to it. All right. Don't forget the fuses and switches. Fuses, pressure cutout switches, pay attention to the pin fit on the connector. I was talking about that earlier. And this is a little thing I put posted in that little uh, chat box we got. You can take this right here and save it in your phone. 
and he uses them for a pretty good little guideline. You got it? Uh, you can share that with Tim because I don't think he's in the chat box. Right? All right, you see how, see how I'm talking about? This is a quick little, just a quick rundown on what you need to do. You need to understand every box. You got it? Test question one. Okay, hurry up. We've got 10 minutes here. Test question one. AC got the cool. What do you do first? <laughs> Concerns been verified, warm airflow, what do you do next? You went for the first one. Huh? You went for the first one. Go back to the first one. Yeah. Alright, we're good. The compressor doesn't engage. Now what do you do? Well, you know, some people do that, you know. There'll be a couple of guys over there put an engine in or something like that, and you'll ask the guy that's hanging out with them over there to shoot the bulls, like, what are you doing? Oh, I'm helping them. You know, you know, when they're not helping nobody, they're just over shooting the bull, a waste of time. Try that at a shop and see how well it works. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, they would, they would jump all over you about it. That's what we're talking about. I'm putting these in my Remove the AC compressor clutch relay if you find power at the terminal feed the relay pole with no power anywhere else. What are you supposed to have in a relay socket when the AC is turned on? What are you supposed to have? You connect the test line to the hot side of the battery, touch the probe to the relay socket, terminal feed the compressor clutch. What should you see there? Yeah. With the engine running, the AC select bell and control head, what should you see at the relay socket? AC always cools just fine for a while and it stops cooling, but there's good airflow. What's the likely cause? AC is not cooling, the compressor doesn't engage. Your customer says he used a piece of wire to bypass the low pressure switch and the AC cools for a while. That airflow stops even though the war motor can be heard. You can hear the blower motor, but you're not getting any air. It starts out cool and good, and you can hear the blower motor, but you're losing your air. Why does it say test question eight? Huh? I may have screwed it up. I may have forgot to put test question nine. Is that supposed to be test question nine? Oh, take that under advisement. I tapped this really fast this morning. I'm going to go cook breakfast right after I did it. We have 11 questions. Outstanding. Uh, there's warm air from the register, but the compressor clutch is engaged and the suction line is cold all the way to the compressor. What's it likely cause of that? We talked about it earlier. Hey, go back for a second. <coughs> Uh, 
customers replace the accumulator at home charge and AC with a can from a park store. AC doesn't cool, but his head pressure quickly goes high enough to blow the pop off. There's a pop off valve on the compressor. If pressure goes too high, it'll go Bleh! Stuff will come out from under the Scared the daylight out of it. What's wrong? I can't believe I put two question eights in there. All right, what do we got here? Eight. Verify the concern. You should have put A on that one. If you didn't put A, slap yourself. All right. Question two, what do you do next? Uh, I check for compressor. Check for compressor operation. I don't know if the compressor engaged. The compressor doesn't the engage. What do you do now? Identify the refrigerant. Identify the refrigerant. Good answer. Static pressures are equal here. 100 PSI, but the pressure is still working. <laughs> Check the electrical circuits for the flash. You remove the AC compressor clutch relay and you find power in the terminal feed the relay pull, but no power anywhere else. Find this magnetic single piece. You want to feed terminal 30. You don't call for the cap room. Right. You connect a Tesla at ah, Tesla. I can't believe I did that to the hot side of the relay and fetch the probe to the relay socket and it feeds the compressor with the key off. What should you see here? Uh, Remember, you're hooked to the hot side of the battery. What should you see? Brown. 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 Feel like a test line, right? With the engine running, the AC selected on the control head, what should you see at the relay socket? Two power, two, two, ground. Ground. two power, two ground. Okay. AC uh, always... Go back, go back, go back. What? Go back. I got one, right? Two power, two ground. Hey. Some of them, they got no. that stuff. It's what he does. Yeah, you got to mix up. What did you I got mix all that? I got all that. Got he mixed up? It ain't hard to do. All right. AC always cools just fine for a while and stops cooling or good airflow. What's like they call it? Uh, air gap. Air gap. Air gap problem. AC's not cooling, the compressor doesn't engage. The, the airflow is the key to that. Because you still got good airflow. So. AC didn't cool the compressor doesn't engage. Compressor, uh, customer says he used a piece of wire to bypass the low pressure switch. And the AC cools for a while, then airflow stops even though the motor can be heard. Bad relay? Bad low pressure switch. Bad low pressure switch because he bypassed that. There's warm air from the register, but the compressor clutch is engaged and the suction line is cold all the way to the compressor. What's likely to be a problem? A bad condenser thing. What do you think? Uh, blend door action. Blend door action. Customers replace the accumulator at home and charge the AC. He didn't pull a vacuum on it. He just put juice in there, and there's air in there too. And now you got an air compressor because air won't condense into liquid. Got that? Air so, in the system. There was a guy that came to my, my buddy Dunny's shop over there, and he had a like a 06 Impala, and it was blowing the fuse, feeding the compressor clutch because the call sometimes the call on a compressor will get shorted just enough to work. It'll start to work for a little while, and then it'll pop the fuse. All right. Now this this it gets better, so pay attention. Okay. So he says I'll have to put a compressor clutch on there, so I'll bring it back Monday. Well, they never showed up Monday. It didn't show up Tuesday, it didn't show up Wednesday. It showed up about a week later than it was supposed to. And the guy says, now I've got all kinds of other problems. And uh, so he got to looking and the guy had taken a piece of uh, 12 gauge Romex wire and stripped it off and crammed it in there where the AC fuse went. Because he said, I can fix this where it won't blow that fuse. I'll just put this in there. Yeah. Well, they heated I've the wire. That, I've done that one time. Yeah, that yeah. sounds like you. He heated. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't for my AC or not. It's like for my amp because the wire was too small. Uh, so anyway, just, the guy destroyed his wire harness. I mean, the wire the wire going through there, and, and he said, and I said, look, I can fix this, but you're going to have to pay me as long as it takes, and it may take 10, 12 hours. He said, I'm going to split the harness. And I'm like, we're going to fix all, all the wires that, you, that got burned up on the way, you know, heated up. And he says, they melted them together. And he says, now we can try to get a harness. Well, the harness is not available from GM anymore. 